All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, and I want to thank you all for joining us. Welcome you to our September Conservative Women's Network, and special thanks to our partner, the Heritage Foundation, Bridget Wagner, for co-hosting Conservative Women's Network with us every month. I'd like to introduce you to this month's speaker, economist Diane Fritchcott Roth, who is speaking today about her new book, Women's Figures and the Economics of Women in America. At a time when liberal leaders and mainstream media are claiming there's a war on women, this book gives timely insight and answers to important questions like, are American women victims? Can they hold their own in the workplace? What is the truth about the so-called glass ceiling and She's going to give answers to some of these questions and uh, talk a little bit about the extensive data and research she's done to back that up. Diana currently serves as a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. She's a contributor, contributing editor of RealClearMarkets.com and a columnist for the Washington Examiner, MarketWatch.com, and Tax Notes. Previously, she was chief economist of the U.S. Department of Labor, and she served as chief of staff of President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors. She served as Deputy Executive Director of the Domestic Policy Council and Associate Director of the Office of Policy Planning in the White House under President George H.W. Bush. And she was an economist on the staff of President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. You don't look old enough to have done all that. <laughs> uh, in addition to Women's Figures, an Illustrated Guide to the Economics of Women in America, She's also the author of a brand new book, which I'm going to hold up here. Maybe we should have made this about this, although it doesn't come out until uh, a couple of weeks. It's called Regulating to Disaster, How Green Jobs Policies Are Damaging America's Economy. Diane is a frequent guest on Fox Business News, and she's appeared on many, many other TV and radio programs. Her articles have been published in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Investor Business Daily, and many other papers. She received her BA in Economics from Swarthmore College and her Master of Philosophy in Economics from Oxford University. And her areas of expertise are many, including employment, taxation, education, pensions, unionization, and immigration. Wife of 29 years, mother of six children. Please join me in welcoming Diana Fritchcott Roth. Well, thank you so much for coming. I can think of so many better things to do than sit here listening to me, and I'm really grateful to all of you for coming. Uh, the reason uh, I wrote uh, this book, uh, Women's Figures, was because back in 1997, Barbara Ledeen, who was then head of the Independent Women's Forum, said that we need a book showing uh, the truth about the wage gap the truth about the glass ceiling in order to combat all the myths that there are about women making only 75 cents on a man's dollar. And I said, Barbara, no one believes in the wage gap. There's no point in putting any of this together. No one believes in the glass ceiling. And she said, yes, Diana, there are really people who believe in it. And now, in uh, 2012, years later, uh, people are still talking about women making 75 cents on the dollar, or 77 cents on the dollar, or sometimes 78. President Obama has said that women make 78 cents on the dollar, and he uses that as a rationale for affirmative action for women, policies that would benefit women and hurt men. And what's interesting is that if a Martian were to come down to ground, if a Martian were to come and see there were two groups of people, men and women, and one of the groups earned 58% of all BAs and MAs, and m more than half of PhDs, and an equal number of medical degrees, and an equal number of legal degrees, and had a longer life expectancy by about five years, and a lower unemployment rate, and there were fewer of this group in jail, fewer on drugs, they would say, oh, this must be the favored group of people. And if that Martian then heard, no, it's this group that's discriminated against, this group that the president and Democrats want to give affirmative action to. This Martian would just be amazed.
because by many, many uh, metrics, women are doing better than men. But yet, President Obama uh, is pushing for the Paycheck Fairness Act, uh, which uh, fortunately did not pass even a Democratic Congress. And that would have required employers to turn over to the government lists of employees with their salaries uh, and race and sex so that the government could check and see whether women were being paid the same as men. And the whole crux of this comes down to the measurement of something called the wage gap. And it's true that if you average full-time men and full-time women and compare that number, yes, women do make about 77 cents on the dollar. But that's averaging all women with all men. And women make different choices. They make different choices in terms of education. You can see when they're at school, there are more women that major in English and unfortunately gender studies and comparative literature. And there are more men that major in chemistry and physics and math and computer science. So that's one choice women make that means that they're in a different kind of career path. And I wouldn't say that that's the wrong choice to make. That's just their preferences as to what to do. And then often when they go into the workforce, you can see that full-time women work about 10% fewer hours than full-time men. Full-time, you see, is anything over 35 hours a week. And so if you work uh, 35 hours, you're full-time. If you work 50 or 60 hours, you're also counted as full-time. The Labor Department doesn't make any difference between those. So when you average in women's hours and men's hours full-time, you find that women uh, work about 10% fewer hours, and that's one reason that, on average, uh, they make less. If you look at different groups of women, for example, young single women and young single men, you find that women actually make more than men do in that demographic group. Uh, if you look at men and women who work 40 hours a week, you just take 40 hours a week, the wage gap to goes to about 86 cents on the dollar. If you look at these numerous econometric studies that economists have done, uh, the latest being by June O'Neill, who's just published a study with the National Center for Policy Analysis, if you take everything constant, if you look at a male and a female legal associate, for example, or a first year uh, lawyer, they in the same firm, they make the same. First year supermarket cashier, male and female, they make about the same. So where you find the divergence is that women frequently choose jobs with more flexible schedules. And it's interesting to go on the Yale Law School women's site. You go to Yale Law School, you click on Yale Law Women, and you get their site. And they evaluate the top companies for jobs, what they consider are the top companies for their graduates, their law school graduates to take. And to get into Yale Law School, you've got to be pretty smart. These are some of the smartest, most ambitious women in the country. Well, what do you think are the characteristics of these top firms that Yale Law women choose? They have flexible schedules. It's not the ones that will have 60 or 80 hour a week. No, they're the ones that have flexible schedules. Yale Law School female graduates want to work for firms that have flexible schedules so they can combine their family life with their work life. And it's unfortunate that jobs with flexible schedules often pay less than jobs with inflexible schedules. Just like dangerous jobs, uh, you have to pay more for someone to have a dangerous job mining, logging, construction, uh, than a more safe job in an office. I, for one, would prefer a safer job in the office to being 50 feet up in 15 degree weather on outdoor scaffolding. I'm just not built for that. And uh, many women also make that same choice. So the wage gap is mythical when you account for women in like-minded situations. Uh, it's only when you compare uh, women in flexible jobs with men with inflexible jobs, men in dangerous jobs such as logging with, with women in safer jobs, that you get these different kinds of gaps. And these affirmative action policies would slow down America's economy. 
they would force uh, women to be considered not just for themselves but as quotas. The Paycheck Fairness Act would add to the employment burden. That would mean employers would want to employ fewer uh, people, including fewer women. Uh, the new Health Care Act, for example, has a penalty of $2,000 per worker if you're a firm moving from 49 upwards. If you harm more than 49 workers and you don't have the right kind of health insurance, you have to pay a penalty of $2,000 per worker. And the Obama administration says how great this health care plan is for women, the new uh, patient care and affordable, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Well, it's not good for women because it means that there are fewer women employed, fewer Americans employed. Uh, similarly to the green jobs policies, and this book that's, uh, the pub date is September 25th. There are many copies available. You can pre-order it on Amazon. Talks about the green jobs policies that the president says are good for the economy, good for the environment. Well, they're not good for women because they lower employment, because women have a lower chance of getting jobs. And when you look at what women want, it's not that they want free contraceptives what they, and free health care. What they want is a chance to be economically secure and for their families to be economically secure and for their spouses and themselves not to have to worry about getting a job. About 25% of women work part-time. So it's not that they all want 60 to 80 hour jobs. They want to have that part-time job or that full-time job or that 60 hour job. But they want a good chance of employment. And these green jobs policies that raise the cost of energy and raise utility bills because solar and wind and biomass cost more uh, to produce electricity than do natural gas. Uh, and natural gas generates a lot of jobs with hydro fracturing. We can see in North Dakota, and Michelle was just telling me that uh, Newt Gingrich just gave a speech about this. In North Dakota, the unemployment rate is 3% because North Dakota, the land there is mostly privately owned. And there, uh, people can have the choice of allowing oil companies to explore for natural resources, oil and natural gas on their land. So uh, it's important just to have an economic policy that allows people to go out in the workforce and get jobs. And that's what we need to be focusing on the, in the future, taking down these barriers to employment, whether they're affirmative action, whether it's the Paycheck Fairness Act, whether it's requirements that states generate a certain percentage of their electricity with renewables. Think about it in California by 2020. 33% of electricity will have to be generated by renewables. That's going to make electric bills sky high, and it's also going to hurt lower income Americans who pay right now, the bottom fifth pays about 22% of their income in uh, electric utility bills, natural gas bills, and motor fuel. Uh, another regulation that the president has just brought out is very anti-women. It's the CAFE standard that would drive up miles per gallon for cars to 55 miles per gallon. And many women who have children know that they need a car large enough to get their kids in, to put all the stuff in the back, like the hockey sticks, the football, when they're younger, the, the stroller, uh, the diaper bag. And these small cars just don't do it. Plus, they're less safe. So you're more likely to get killed if you're in an accident in one of these smaller, lighter, thinner cars. So this is another example of a regulation that's very anti-women and very unfamily friendly. So I think I've talked enough right now. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. And uh, Claire, my research assistant, who makes sure that all the numbers I have are right, uh, has a table of uh, electricity expenses by income group if you're interested, so you can see how these green energy regulations hurt people in the lowest quintile because expenses on energy make up a larger percentage of their income, and she's going to pass that out. So I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Do we have a microphone here today? 
Um, for questions? Oh, okay. All righty, great. So if you'll raise your hand, uh, Dana will call on you. If you give your name and your uh, affiliation. I'm wondering if you're looking at trends also, and what do you see? Um, if you see a correlation, I can anticipate what your answer would be, but I wonder if you can share. As government grows and as um, they put in more um, regulations and more of these programs to benefit women, what do you see is actually the impact on women? So, so government spending has grown as the, regula as the regulatory state has grown. So as the regulatory state has grown, you especially see this in the last four years with the stimulus package, we find that uh, the debt is larger, the deficit has been above a trillion for four years in a row, and this is money that has to be paid back. It's slowing the economy, just as, by the way, what Ben Bernanke did yesterday to weaken the currency uh, is also slowing the economy. And that's not benefiting anybody, it's not benefiting men, it's not benefiting women. Uh, we can see that with uh, national debt, at 16 trillion, this is something our children and grandchildren have to pay off. It's like going shopping with a credit card and saying, I'm not gonna worry about it. After I die, my kids are gonna pay off my credit card bill. So that's basically what we're asking our children to do with all this borrowing. 35 cents out of every dollar the government spends is borrowed. And it has other effects too. With unemployment insurance at 99 weeks instead of 26 weeks, it changes people's incentives to go out into the workforce. People feel like they have to, to get all their unemployment insurance benefits. They're gonna have to wait out 99 weeks. We need to think of better ways of delivering unemployment insurance. We need to think about, first of all, ratcheting it back to 26 weeks. And second, instead of spacing it out every week or every month, we should think about giving it in a lump sum at the beginning. That doesn't discourage people from going back to work because they have it already. Plus, they would be able to enroll in a training program. Or they could move to somewhere like North Dakota. They could use that lump sum to move from an area that doesn't have jobs to an area that does have jobs, such as uh, some of the Texas oil operations, uh, North Dakota, uh, elsewhere in the country where the unemployment rate is low. So these government programs have big disincentives to work. Uh, we can see this with Social Security Disability also. It's a program that now you can count as disabled if you say that you have mental problems or a combination of problems. Now there are many people who do have real problems who cannot work, but the way the new disability regulations are, it makes it much easier to qualify as disabled without any particular medical condition. So. Uh, in answer, all these government programs are basically changing the character of our society in a very detrimental way. When I was at school in England, uh, I would come back here during the summer and I would get a summer job. My fellow students who were English would be able to go on unemployment insurance in the summer. This was in the early 80s. I don't know if you could still do that, but that was how it worked then. So they would go on unemployment insurance and they would go traveling in Europe. And to me, that was just, it was just incredible. Well, quite a lot of England was a little bit incredible to me. When I got there from Swarthmore College, there were students protesting in the street because they were, they were given tuition free, they were given a cost of living grant, but their cost of living grant wasn't gonna go up with inflation, it was gonna go up less than inflation. So they were protesting. This was mind boggling to me because here, in America, we had to pay for school. We didn't get any grants. And here these people were so lucky, but they were protesting. It wasn't good enough for them. So these uh, programs, over the long run, people get used to them, and it has detrimental effects. And you think, um, well, I'm being paid in England uh, 100 pounds. If I earn more than 100 pounds a week, I won't get the benefit for my child. So I'm going to look for a job, but not more than 100 pounds a week. Someone English uh, said that to me recently. and it gets a completely different mindset. You're trying to model your life around government handouts to maximize your government handouts rather than thinking, how can I make it on my own? Hi, yes, um, Alicia Barrett from the Franklin Center. Um, I was hoping you could expand a little more on the glass ceiling argument. Um, you've kind of debunked the, the wage gap and, and claimed it as a myth and, and proven why that's true, but 
I remember professors and, and fellow students in college, and they kept bringing up the glass ceiling. And, and what facts are they drawing on? Are they, are they comparing, like, women CEOs to men CEOs? Or if you can kind of give us some talking points as to how to counter that. Sure. Well, when they talk about the glass ceiling, uh, people refer to the fact that there are fewer women CEOs and there are fewer women on boards of directors. And they say that the reason for this is that there's a glass ceiling and that these companies don't want to hire women. And the real reason, I believe, and this is supported by academic studies such as Marianne Bertrand from the University of Chicago, she has done a study showing that women in corporate America get paid the same as men in corporate America. The problem is that there are fewer women who go into corporate America. So these women at Yale Law School who want the family-friendly jobs, being on the CEO track is not a family-friendly job. So if you have the top women in America looking for flexible jobs, you know right away they're not going to make it to the CEO. They're not going to make it to the corner office. They're probably also not going to make it to the boards of directors. So what you have to do is look at women who are working uh, uh, full-time, working the 60, 80 to hour, hour week CEO track, and look at are they as successful as men who are on that same track. And I think the answer is yes, looking at many of these studies. The problem is that some women feel as though they're entitled to be on the CEO track, even if they're not working all the hours. And uh, that's difficult. I mean, you know, you probably read the article by Anne-Marie Slaughter in Atlantic Magazine where she said she had trouble with her job at the State Department because she had two teenage boys at home and eventually she left the State Department and decided to go back to Princeton. Uh, so even some women right at the top don't feel like they can manage uh, family and uh, career. But the ones who think that they can, the ones who do, they have a great chance of being a CEO. So uh, I don't think there's a glass ceiling for women who want to put in the ass. Although there do appear to be challenges with balancing children and work. And if you look at some of the, th the three latest Supreme Court justices who were nominated who were women, so Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, and Harriet Myers, whose nomination uh, was later withdrawn, none of them have any children. Uh, Secretary Child, Labor Department, Secretary Rice, Condoleezza Rice, uh, they don't have children. They devote all their time to their careers and they make it right to the top. Yes. Courtney from townhall.com. Um, you mentioned some like affirmative action policies that were put in place because of the supposed wage gap. I was wondering if you could tell us like some Examples of today's feminists, how they've, how they've exploited this like supposed wage gap? So what today's feminists do, uh, the, um, the original feminists wanted equality of opportunity. And it used to be in the 1950s, jobs could be advertised at one salary for men and another salary for women. And if you were pregnant, you could be dismissed from your job or you couldn't apply for a certain job. And in the olden days, way back, women couldn't even vote. So the original feminists wanted to fix that. They wanted to make sure that women had equality of opportunity. And now women do have equality of opportunity. If a woman feels that she's being paid less than a man, we have many, many laws to deal with that. That woman can sue. Uh, many women sue. Many women win. Although it's interesting, by the way, just as an aside, under the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, uh, that was the first bill signed by President Obama in January 2009. Only 30 women uh, in this uh, three-year period have sued under that law. So obviously, uh, the demand has not been very great for that particular provisions of the laws. The legal system we have uh, seems to be adequate for that. Anyway, so fast forward to the new set of feminists. They don't uh, they were not content with equality of opportunity. They want equality of outcome. I've debated people who say there's discrimination in construction because not 50% of women are construction workers. 50% of construction workers are not women. They say there's discrimination between because 50% of congresswomen, congressmen are not female. They say there's discrimination because 50% of CEOs are not women. 
So what they want, are looking for is equality of outcome, and that's how the Title IX developed. Under Title IX, with men's and women's sports in universities, universities have to give the same amount to women's sports as men's sports in proportion to the women who are enrolled in that university. So if 55% of students are female, 55% of the sports budget has to go to women even though fewer of them want to play sports. And there was a New York Times article on this about a year ago showing how schools are trying to game the system, how if someone signs up, if a woman signs up for a team and decides she doesn't want to play later on, they keep her on the roster. And the question is, and they say you don't have to go to practice. They think of rowing where you don't have to go out on the river and row, you can just row inside and then occasionally go out on the river. They do anything to attract women into these sports because if the women don't play, the men can't play, and there are more men who want to play than women. So the new feminists don't want to give up with equality of opportunity. They want equality of outcome, and that's because if they didn't want to move the goalposts, they wouldn't have a job. They wouldn't have anything to say. They can't just declare victory and go home because there wouldn't be a cause. It's like the March of Dimes after polio was cured. These people just didn't have anything to do. They were less relevant. And these feminists don't want to be irrelevant. So they are continually moving the goalposts. And I don't think there will ever be 50% of CEOs who are women. I don't think there'll ever be 50% uh, of uh, boards of directors who are women, unless that's required as a quota, in which case it would be damaging to our economic growth. So, but that's why they're doing that, to keep themselves relevant, not because uh, I think many of them, not, not because it's the right thing to do. Yes. Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm with the Luce Institute. Um, you touched on the Lilly Ledbetter Act a little bit. I just wondered if I could ask you to expand upon that and tell us what, if any, economic ramifications you see from that. Um, <coughs> clearly, the legal ramifications have not proven to be enormous because people don't really use it that much. But is there anything economic that we should be looking for with that? So what the Lilly Ledbetter Act did was it said that you could go back in time if you think that your employer of, say, 20 or 30 years ago discriminated against you, and that has effects in your current job. And that was extremely it's potentially extremely burdensome because the person who made that decision about your salary then might not even be alive, the firm might not even be in business, uh, and it's one of the few laws that have, besides murder, that has practically no backward statute of limitations. And this is potentially very burdensome to employers if uh, women were coming out of the woodwork and suing in great numbers because, as all of you know, uh, lawsuits and litigation is expensive. Me uh, lawsuits uh, slow down our economy in some areas that we can document, such as malpractice, for example. Uh, nuclear power is another example. But uh, it doesn't look like it's had that much effect because there have only been about 30 lawsuits uh, that, that came from it. So I think that in terms of the economy, it isn't having that much effect, even though it potentially could have. I think that the other laws that we have, the Equal Pay Act, the Civil Rights Act, are sufficient to ensure that women are not discriminated against. Plus, employers are very leery of breaking these laws. They go out of their way to make sure men and women are paid equally. Yes. Oh, you didn't tell me you were recording all of oh, this. I should have been more careful. Inside, no, it's been oh. wonderful. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm Eleanor Renner. I'm from yeah. the Heritage Foundation. I read the Atlantic article that you yeah. referenced, and I found it rather um, discouraging. It talked about how women who want to pursue a career often put building a family on hold, and then they find later when they're in their 40s and 50s that it's just it's harder to do. And that then on the other side, women who want to start building a family have to make compromises between their family needs and their work hours. Mm -hmm. You obviously have uh, an amazing professional career and a family. Do you have any personal advice for those of us who are on the other side of starting a family? What to do or like? Uh, 
Well, I mean, as you can see, it's not impossible. You can have six children work in three White Houses, um, publish your fourth and fifth book, and um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's certainly not impossible. I would say, well, two things. First of all, one child changes your life. Once you've had one child, it doesn't matter how many you have. Because, <laughs> well, I mean, there are vast economies of scale. I mean, if you have one child, you love that child, and you want to be home for that child, and you, want, and you miss that child, and you kind of want to be home for dinner with that child. And so it doesn't really matter if you have two, three, four, or five. The point is that then you start feeling a preference for less travel over more travel. You start to want to kind of cut back on your schedule. But you don't have to. I mean, people who have, uh, you know, uh, support, it's not actually that you can buy the support. I mean, I have a husband who's very, very supportive, and in fact, when I just had my third child, I was offered a job in George H.W. Bush's White House as Deputy Executive Secretary of the Domestic Policy Council. And I thought, well, I have three children, three and under. I just cannot take this job. And he said, Diana, you don't know when you're going to get another opportunity. You take the job. I'll be home at 5 o'clock every day, and we'll make it work. So that's what happened. Uh, I joined the White House in 1991. And as it turned out, I wouldn't have had another opportunity because in 1992, President Bush lost the election. And I wouldn't have had another opportunity for the next eight years. So he was right. So having a supportive husband is very helpful. Also having a help at home is uh, also uh, very helpful. There are these au pair programs, so it's not very expensive to have help in the home these days uh, with the State Department au pair program. And uh, the problem is the kind of feelings you have of not wanting to leave your child, and that's what makes women often cut back on their travel schedule. It's not that they have to, because you can get help at home and you can have a supportive husband and family. The problem is that you love these children. I don't know if it's a problem. Anyway, you love these <laughs> children and you want to be there with them. And so you don't want an 80 hour week job. You want to be home maybe when they get back from school. You want to be home on the weekends. You don't want to go off on a week uh, for a week, um, you know. Uh, um, digging up business, you think, well, why am I doing this? I'd rather be helping Tommy with his homework. So the problem is these feelings that people have, and that's why many women choose to work part-time, or they choose to work uh, flexible careers. My job has always been uh, pretty flexible. I haven't had to travel much. I've worked in three White Houses, but these White House jobs didn't involve a lot of travel. It involved domestic and economic policy. And uh, you, the great thing about America is that there's so many different kinds of jobs and opportunities. You see people making opportunities for themselves, such as you see more doctors, for example, in group practices, and they decide they're going to work a few days a week, and it doesn't cut back on their careers. Uh, you see people teaching and uh, writing. That doesn't cut back on their careers. The CEO track, I would say, does take a lot of time away from your family, and that's why fewer women are CEOs. Trish Secret, I don't have any affiliation other than being a private citizen. Um, I, I'm thinking of the widows. Well, uh, the you're a taxpayer, um, so that's a <laughs> very important affiliation. Um, citizen. Um, I'm thinking of, of the widows and the orphans, and I'm not trying to be facetious, but with the economic policy and low interest rates, we're hurting the widows and the orphans, which is to say their pensions and how they're going to um, you know, live in their retirement. And I think that that's an argument that would resonate with people. We bash Wall Street, a lot of people do, um, and yet the losers really aren't the Wall Street so-called fat cats. They are the widows and the orphans and all of the people who are living trying to make, you know, 5% on their investments and they're making less than 1% on their, you know, money markets and whatnot. And I, I don't know why that argument hasn't been made, number one, because I think it would resonate with voters. Yes, that, that, that's very true, and that's why Ben Bernanke, yesterday when he announced QE3, uh, buying more mortgage-backed securities, keeping interest rates down, that is particularly harmful for people who live off their savings, and there are more elderly women who live off their savings than men because women have a five-year longer life expectancy. And weakening the currency has never caused economic growth. If it did, then all a country would have to do is just devalue its currency, and then, hey, presto, it would be ahead. But you don't find that countries that devalue their currencies do that. And it's not clear that anything 
Chairman Bernanke is going to do along those lines is going to be helpful right now because interest rates were already low. I mean, say they were high at the beginning, such as 6 or 7 percent, then maybe you could argue going down to 5 percent or 4 percent. You might be able to argue that could temporarily stimulate the economy. But keeping interest rates lower than they are right now, they're already at rock bottom levels. It's very difficult to see what that can do. And it's made already commodity prices rise. It's made long-term yields uh, go up because people are concerned about inflation. And inflation is the ultimate theft of property from people who have been saving up and then the government uh, devalues uh, what you have saved. It even goes beyond having a low interest rate. It's taking away what you own. So this is a very important consideration. It's very important for women because of their longer life expectancy. Diane, I was watching Fox uh, a few nights ago. It was late. It must have been Greta. And Governor Palin was on. And she was starting to make this point. And, but she didn't finish it, so I want to ask you to finish it. She said, I thought, this is a poster for our students. She said, these people who want all this free stuff in America, mm. they have to realize that if they get the free stuff, they lose freedom. Did you finish that? I, I wanted yeah. her to go another 45 seconds on it. Yeah, well, I think that what she's trying to say is that all these um, freebies, they kind of tie you down, and so they prevent you looking out for yourself and working for yourself. Just as I was giving the example of the 99 weeks of unemployment benefit, you don't want to take that lower-paying job because you're going to lose the unemployment benefit, whereas if the unemployment benefit expired after the 26 weeks and you didn't have anything, and then you might shift down to that lower-paying job, if you couldn't find another one, and that would be better for you because you would be in the workforce. And it just changes the attitude. If you're given a lot of free things, then you don't have to go and get them for yourself. And it's better if you are, and also the depiction of free, I think, is incorrect because it comes out of tax dollars. You are paying for it with your taxes. So you're paying more taxes to the government, and then they are giving you more products. It's better if you have the money yourself, and you go out and choose what you want. So taxes in Europe, where they have uh, government-provided health care, government-provided education, taxes there are around uh, 40 or 50 percent, and on top of that, they have a 20 percent value-added tax. So they pay very high taxes for what they get. It's not free, and in some sense, they're basically wards of the state, because when these things are provided by government, then an there's less private sector provision of them. So if the universities are all government, it's much harder for a private university to come and compete. If the doctors are government provided, it's very hard to be a private doctor and compete. One of my former colleagues, Erwin Stolzer, once told me about how he had this um, medical problem in London. He used to, at that time, live in London. He woke up and he saw double. I said, well, that must be pretty good if you can see two breakfasts and <laughs> two of your, you know, your, your, your wife twice. But no, anyway, he didn't think it was, uh, it was optimal. He called up his doctor, his private doctor, who accompanied him. This was a Sunday. Accompanied him every step of the way to different hospitals to get the tests. And Irwin said to him, well, you know, thanks very much. It's really great work. Thanks for doing all this. And he said, well, you have to be pretty good if you're competing against free. So you have to be twice as good. You don't have all these different kinds of uh, you don't have all these different kinds of options. And I think one good example is the schools in the inner cities, where they are provided and they're free, and they are very low quality. They have about a 55 percent graduation rate, compared with 75 percent for the U.S. as a whole, which is not that great either. It's really a terrible indictment of our educational system. And it's interesting that every other kind of benefit that we have, if we give someone food stamps, all right, they have the food stamps, but at least they get to go and pick their grocery store. We don't say you have to go to the grocery store in your neighborhood. Imagine if there was a headline, President Obama requires food stamp recipients to go to grocery stores in their neighborhood. There'd be a revolution. People would say, there isn't a good grocery store in my neighborhood, or the grocery store in my neighborhood doesn't have fresh fruit or vegetables. But when we make low-income students go to schools in their neighborhood. There isn't any revolution. They just accept it, even though they are very low quality. Or, as in Chicago, the teachers are going on strike and haven't even provided any schools. So you can't even send them to school. 
Now imagine if we gave each one of these families, instead of food stamps, school stamps. We say, here's the amount we would spend on your child. And in New York, it's about $18,000 a year, close to that in DC too. So we'll, we will give you an $18,000 a year school stamp, and you go to whatever school you want. There would be an immediate resurgence in the supply of uh, these schools. There'd be more schools that would open. The good schools would expand. Uh, people would have more choice. The overall quality would go up. And it wouldn't be free anymore, but you would have the money that your taxes would be paying for it in any case. And it would raise the quality. Anything else? I had a quick question, Diana. You, um, you served in so many um, past administrations, as you said. And I mean, there's still a number of policies that are yet to go into effect here in this administration, the Dodd-Frank, the, um, the health care law. Still, mm -hmm. we haven't seen those fully um, deployed. And the impact, I think, on the employment situation is going to be dramatic. But if you were to go into the next administration, I mean, what would be the one or two kind of dramatic policy changes? Or if you're on the outside looking in, what would be the one or two dramatic policy changes that you would be looking for? you would say would send a, an incredibly strong signal to the marketplace or to conservatives like us that things are turning a corner, this is a different policy direction. What are the things that you think are most important right off the bat to, to send a really powerful signal? Well, I wrote this book, um, Regulating to Disaster, because I think in some sense we are already in disastrous territory now with a slow GDP growth rate, an unemployment rate above 8%. Uh, a labor force participation rate equal to September 1981, which is right at the beginning of that decade where millions of women moved into the labor force. And one very strong signal a president would be capable of sending would be speeding up energy permitting. This is something that administration could do without congressional approval. See, there are some things the administration can just do, and this is one of them, because the Obama administration has been going slow on permits for energy development. This would send a very strong signal. It would lower the cost of energy. It would attract manufacturing firms back because of the lower energy cost. Uh, and many of these regulations, such as calling carbon a pollutant that EPA has, are very detrimental to our competitive position. We're in a global economy right now. Companies can choose whether they locate here, whether they locate in Canada, Mexico, China, India, you name it. We have to make our business environment attractive so we can attract all these different companies back. And one of the first things an administration could do, do something about our energy policy, because that is within the administration. Uh, it's within the different agencies. It's in their power to do it. So that would send a strong signal. Something else that would require congressional approval would be uh, repeal of Obamacare. And Chief Justice Roberts, in his wisdom, called the penalty a tax. So the fact that it's a tax means that it can be repealed under a process called budget reconciliation. It doesn't take 60 senators. It takes just over 50 senators. It's not subject to a filibuster. So if there were a Republican president and a Republican Senate, then Obamacare could be repealed. And the reason this is so destructive is because of the tax on hiring new workers. If a company moves from 49 to 50 workers, that company pays $40,000 right away in penalties because it's $2,000 per worker. The first 30 workers are exempt, so that's 20 times 2,000. And for every additional worker that company hires, it's another $2,000. So this is a big, big detriment to work, to hiring, uh, for, uh, to firms' expansion. You can see that any company right now that's at 45 is saying, I'm not going to get above 49. Any company that's at 55 is saying, well, if I just let go of six, if when Betty retires, we don't replace her, and uh, Joe is going to quit, if we don't replace him, then we'll get to 49. And then we don't have to pay the penalties. Uh, we won't have to pay that extra $40,000. Well, this starts on January 1st, 2014. So you can see there's a lot of uncertainty. And so I would try, uh, if I were an administration, to end that Obamacare penalty right away. And I think that would be very positive. I would also try to have certainty as to tax rates. I would try fundamental tax reform, lowering the tax rates. Uh, Romney has suggested lowering them by 20%. So the top rate would be 28%. The bottom rate would be 8% instead of 10% to 35% right now. 
He's also suggested lowering the corporate tax rate from 35 to 25, because right now we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. And again, we need to make uh, the United States a friendly place to do business. There's no reason we should have a corporate tax rate that's about 11 percentage points higher than the OECD average. But this, again, tax reform takes Congress. It's not something administration can do right away. So I hope that's some answer to the question. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thanks so much for inviting me. And thank, thank, thank all of you for coming. And I'd be very happy to answer questions. Or if you buy the books, I'd be happy to autograph them. <laughs> It was really informative. It was just an excellent talk. Well, thanks and so I much, And I won't Michelle. do it if you don't want it, but I hope you'll let us put it on our Clever Booth website. Sure. It's, it's just an inside camera here where they okay. change it, but it's just excellent. I have for you the limited edition Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute oh, coffee thank mug you so with much. a famous saying. I think you know what that saying is, don't you? No yeah. good deed goes unpunished. There yeah. you go. <laughs> and our new purple tote bag. Oh, thank Every you. woman, you can put that all your gifts be, in there. Yes, that will be very, very <laughs> useful. Yes, thank you and, so much. Uh, from the Heritage Foundation, one of your former Reagan colleagues has autographed our um, guide, oh. Heritage Guide to the Constitution. Monday is Constitution Day for those oh, of you who that's don't know. Wonderful. And um, as a gift to all of you all who are joining us today, we've got a pocket constitution. So if you have one yourself, be sure to take one um, for your spouse or your kids or your kid's teacher, more likely. The one who needs it. <laughs> it's true, actually. Yeah. And, Very true. Uh, and we've got flyers. We now have um, the Guide to the Constitution online in a searchable format with lots of additional resources. So it's a great thing to bookmark and um, to send out to friends on Constitution Day. So we've got lunch outside, and we'd love for you all to stay and join us and continue the discussion with Diana. But thanks again uh, for this terrific presentation. We look forward to having you back for this next book as well. Oh, so well, thank, thank you. All. you. And thanks, okay. all of you for, thank all of you for coming.